We've heard this term, down in the pits, right? And different things put us down in the pits dependent upon our personality. But really, the great pit is our sin nature. And I want to illustrate that by thinking of a slimy pit. You're on the edge, like I'm on the edge of the platform here, and you're walking along, and you notice this slimy, muddy pit. And somebody says, at the bottom of this pit, there is a box of gold. And you're saying to yourself, hmm, gold, slippery slope, I'm not sure. But you make the decision to go down, and you go down faster than you thought you would, and it was slicker than you thought it was, and you're down in the pit. Yeah, you got a pot of gold, okay, but guess what? You're in the pit. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have any free will. But you lose a lot of options once you're in that muddy pit. Uh, can you raise your hand? Yes. Can you scream, help me out of this pit? Yes. Uh, can you throw mud? Yes. But one thing you can't do is you can't climb out of the pit because it's too slickery. It's too, too muddy. It's too slick. And so you're stuck. You have some freedom, but you don't have the freedom to get out of the pit without assistance. This is similar to Adam in the Garden of Eden. He had the freedom to choose what fruits to eat. He wasn't supposed to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he did anyway. He was the only person in the history of the world who had free will other than Jesus Christ. But the moment he ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he lost his options. From then on, he and his descendants have a sin nature, which means we are battling in the pit. And we like to think that we're uh, free from the, the tragedy of the pit once we become a Christian, but that's not true. Otherwise, Paul would not be saying here, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Wait a minute. I already thought I had my salvation. <laughs> How can I be working out what I've already had. And what we need to realize, we'll look at this in a moment, is that salvation has three phases. Salvation from the penalty of sin, which most of you here have. Maybe some still need to make that decision to accept Christ's gift. Freedom from the power of sin in the present, salvation. And salvation from the very presence of sin. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling has much more to do with your relationship to the power of sin. And the power of sin surfaces in our lives at such unique moments. You know, for example, you get a flat tire. Does that bring out your sin nature? A canceled flight, a stalled engine, uh, you get a cold. Uh, the traffic is my big vulnerability. How many idiots can be on one freeway at the same time? <laughs> and we find that there are certain things that kick off our sin nature. And it reminded me of uh, some of you are old enough to remember Bill Gothard and his uh, Basic Youth Conflict Seminar, which talked about, uh, you know, how we and our young people can live a more fulfilled Christian life. And he had this... Uh, button, and it had P-B-P-G-I-N-F-M-Y. Anybody here remember what that button meant? Yeah. Tell me. Yes, that's right. Please be patient with me. God isn't finished yet. And we all need to be wearing that button when our sin nature uh, shows up at those inappropriate moments. Life brings disappointments. The problem with life is it is so daily. And every day brings its challenge. Life is a work in progress, and you are a work in progress. And we need for people to be patient with us, and we need to be patient with others. God is still working. God is not finished yet. And mo most of us recognize those areas of our life where we need to change. It could be something as simple as needing to lose weight. It could be something as complex as dealing with the dark issues in your life that make 
you wrongly think that ending your life would be better. God is still working. And to change our thinking, it's all about our relationship with Christ, making that vibrant and understanding how the life of Christ can become our life and therefore the attitudes of Christ can become our attitudes. Very often, uh, now the, the things that frustrate us like traffic and, uh, you know, a stalled car, those things frustrate us. But we have sometimes put expectations out there that frustrate us unnecessarily. Now, uh, we understand unrealistic expectations. I hope you don't expect your child to speak seven languages by the time they're 10 years old. And uh, you may not be able to improve your IQ 50 points by reading a book. You know, these are unrealistic expectations. But just with realistic expectations, we have enough failure to keep us humble. But failure doesn't have to be fatal. Paul says, I learned to be content. That means even the Apostle Paul was not always content all the time. We need to look to the Lord for how we get this kind of relationship with God. If you look at your outline this morning, to honor Christ, and this is something that we would say we want to do, to honor Christ, you need to improve your relationships by noting His authority. Therefore, because of the obedience to the cross and who He is, God highly exalted Him, Jesus. So Christ was obedient, God exalted him, and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus uh, is Lord. Those on heaven, those under the earth, those on the earth. So noting his authority, and his authority is having the name above every name. I have this book by Horton called The Names of Christ. And it gives uh, dozens of names, namely 308 names attributed to Jesus Christ. 308 names attributed to Jesus Christ. That alone tells you uh, he is different. In the Old Testament, there are primarily three names for God. The three names for God in the Old Testament are Elohim, uh, Jehovah, or Yahweh, and Adonai. In the New Testament, the two new names, the two names for God are typically Jehovah and, and Adonai. The most common name for God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, occurring 663 times, is Lord. The Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that title, Lord, or ultimately in, in the Greek, which became Latin, Dominus, means master. Jesus is the Lord. He is the master. And this uh, Jesus name itself means Jehovah saves. Yahshua. Yahshua. Jesus saves. That's his name. Jehovah saves. He saves what? He saves you and me from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and someday from the very presence of sin. His full name, and this uh, is talked about in the Names of Christ book, his full name is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, meaning there aren't others, Jesus, Yah, Yahshua saves, Jehovah saves, Christ, the promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the name that is above every name, and it's that name that uh, the famous missionary E. Stanley Jones took to India many years ago. And E. Stanley Jones, I mean, he was a magnetic speaker. People came to hear him that were atheists just to hear his communication style. But anyway, a Hindu priest uh, came to E. Stanley Jones and said, obviously, the masses in India are responding to your message. But you keep talking about the Lord Jesus. Now, we have the Lord Krishna, and we have the Lord Kali. If you just mention that Jesus 
is Lord and Krishna is Lord and Kali is Lord, you would have a much greater impact because you wouldn't be alienating so many people. Well, as you can guess, uh, uh, Dr. Jones did not mention Lord Kali and Lord Krishna because there is only one Lord and one Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the similar situation faced the Apostle Paul and the people in the, in the church of Philippi because uh, Caesar was called Lord. And the gods on Mount Olympus, which were uh, waning in terms of popularity, but they were called Lord. And it was because the Christians insisted there's only one Lord, and that one Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Christians got into trouble and were martyred by the thousands cruelly and unjustly. To honor someone is good. We, we need to honor people. If we were, let's say that, for example, this morning we were an audience of authors and J.K. Rowling were to come into the room, we would stand and honor her. Let's say for a moment that we were uh, a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, astronaut fans, and if Buzz Aldrin, who's still living, by the way, at 92 and walked on the moon, Buzz Aldrin still alive, if he were to walk into the room this morning, we would stand in his honor. But if the Lord Jesus Christ walked in here, we wouldn't stand, we would bow. For he is Lord of all, and he is above all. Gwen and I uh, one time went to the concert, excuse me, the live, live play, The Music Man by Meredith Wilson. And it was fabulous. We enjoyed our time so much but at the end of the concert, they play 76 trombones, let the big parade with 110 cornets. Well, anyway, at the end of the musical, 76 trombones came into the auditorium marching down the aisles. And I said, now, this is quite unique. I wonder what it was that motivated them to go all through the county and round up 76 trombone players. And after they came in and finished, and of course the audience was ecstatic that they got to see the 76 trombones, and the MC said, you may wonder why we went to all the trouble to, to uh, recruit 76 trombones here this evening. Today in our audience, Meredith Wilson, the composer and playwright of The Music Man, will you stand up, Meredith? And it was about a 10-minute standing ovation for Meredith Wilson. I'm wondering how long, when Jesus Christ returns, we will bow. Will it be for 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 10 hours? In our hearts, I think, of course, we will bow for all eternity. So Buzz Aldrin, he walked on the moon. Well, two years ago, there was an earth landing by a baby called Jesus. And it made Mark I mean, uh, Armstrong's moon landing looked less notable for the Son of God left heaven to touch down on planet Earth. To honor Christ, you have to improve your relationship with Christ. Whom we are, whom, to whom are we obey? We are to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and recognizing our responsibility, not only to bow the knee, but the second point in your outline and that every tongue, that every language should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Now, everyone will honor Jesus Christ sooner or later, whether it be people on earth, angels on earth or in heaven, uh, or uh, demons or Satan. And if there are little green men from Mars, they will honor the Lord Jesus Christ too. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father because he has the name that is above every name. Now, these two components should be pretty familiar to you. 
at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That should be familiar to you. And uh, the fact that every tongue will confess. But this last part, understanding the balance between God's work and our work is more complex and very important in terms of living the kind of Christian life that we want to live. So understanding the balance between you work and God works. Here in verse 12, so then my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Doing this in Paul's absence, the Philippians were to carry out the mission that Paul gave them in Philippi, which was evangelism and discipleship undoubtedly. And this is very often related to what true character is all about. True character is what you do when no one you know is looking. That's what true character is all about. And so that which we do in secret uh, is a more indicative of our character than that which we do when other people are watching. I'm going to skip that illustration. Think about Eddie. Eddie's a teenager. He's 15 years old. He has his permit to drive as long as mom or dad are in the car, okay? Well, mom and dad go away for the weekend, and uh, the keys are hanging there in the kitchen. And little Eddie says, you know, what's the harm? I know how to drive. I'll take the car out for a little spin. Well, you can already see the story coming. He takes the car out for the spin, runs a stop sign. The police officer is there. And how is he going to explain to his parents that he has to make a court appearance and pay a big fine? Eddie wishes he had done, he had, he had, had that weekend to live over again as if his parents were home and we're watching. It's, it's good to know that people that we trust and respect are watching. Eddie's harmless little adventure was not worth it. So Paul says, in my absence, work out your salvation. And this is sort of an, an odd uh, phrase for those of us from the evangelical tradition where we stress the importance of being born again. That's what gives you the gift of salvation, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His grace, He saves us, and we're born again. But Paul here is telling the Christians at Philippi to work out their salvation. Wait a minute. Paul planted that church in Acts chapter 16. Aren't they already Christians? They are. However, there is a present tense to salvation. The present tense of salvation is to be free from the power of sin. There's even a future tense of uh, salvation, which means that someday we'll be absent from the very presence of sin. No more crazy drivers. Okay, you're getting a, a clue to my lack of patience. You know, Lord, grant me patience and hurry up about it. So our salvation that we work out with fear and trembling is a salvation that delivers us moment by moment from the power of sin. And that's the promise here. And so you know, that's pretty scary. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is scary. But look at the promise then in verse 13. For it is God who's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Bob Devenny, would you stand up, please? Now. I confess to taking the car out at 15 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> now, for Bob to stand up, there was my request and his obedience. This is what's called the middle voice in the Greek language. It involves two wills. It involves the will of the asker and the will of the doer. Thank you, Bob. You can sit down. And it also required two wills to have Bob sit down. And this is the work out your salvation. It is 
God, the Father, through the power of the Son and the Holy Spirit, merging two wills together that we might do God's will. That's, it's not an active voice where God's working alone. It's not the third person voice where you're working by yourself. It's you and God working together to work out your salvation. Connectedness. This is such an important biblical principle. We, we know about connectedness in life. The toaster is only going to toast the toast if it's connected to the electricity. The light bulb is only going to light if the wires are connected in the light bulb. The rose is only going to smell beautiful if it has fertilizer and sunshine and water. And it, it, all those elements need to be connected together in order for something to function properly. Here, the word work in verse 13 requires both the action of God and the action of man. It is impossible for you and I to do God's will only by ourselves. Now, one of the things that's very confusing to you and me about uh, God looking down and, and judging mankind is we know unbelievers who are good people. If you're an unbeliever here today, you may be a good person from all exterior observations. For example, uh, police officers, soldiers, uh, firefighters. When I was pastoring in Prescott, Arizona, uh, one of our school teachers in the church had a husband who died in a fire as a hotshot. Matter of fact, there was a movie made about those hotshots fighting that fire there in uh, Yavapai County and several who gave their lives. Heroes, no question, based upon their behavior. But we need to realize that God's perspective is larger than behavior only. It involves the behavior, and it involves the motive behind the behavior. Uh, to illustrate this in my own life, I'm sure you, in the course of your life, have come across many homeless beggars. And I help them at various levels. But I'm not going to talk about the help. I'm going to talk about why do I help them. Well, there's several different situations. Sometimes I've helped them just to get them out of the church office. Sometimes on the street I've helped them just to get them out of my face. In other words, on the outside level, I did something to help them, but inside, I didn't care if I helped them or not. It was a matter for my convenience and, and, my, and sometimes my self-righteousness that I'm so good I'm able to help this helpless person. My motivations on the inside were not that good. And this is God's perspective. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And sometimes our heart is not so uh, righteous, even though the outside works look good from the casual observer. And so here we find that our, for our lives to count for eternity and to give glory to God, there must not only be the exterior righteousness, which is basically acting according to God's law, but there must be the interior righteousness of acting in the power of the Spirit because God is in you both to work and to do His good pleasure. The, the, there's another analogy here that uh, if you're in a ship that goes down and you're in a lifeboat, and let's picture three people in this lifeboat. The first person is a, I'm a person of great, great faith, I'm going to pray that God sends someone to deliver us. The second person is, well, I'm a person who believes in getting something done. Let's start rowing towards shore. Then the third person says, I think we should pray to God and row towards shore. You see, both are our righteousness properly done. We need both human responsibility and God takes responsibility where we cannot do it. 
We need to rise up our consciousness about what is possible in terms of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Two of the most famous Christian psychiatrists in the world are Frank Minrith and Paul Meyer. These guys are the top shelf Christian psychiatrists. And they talk about that in their counseling, the most dangerous word is the word can't. I can't love my spouse. You know, I can't overcome my feelings of depression. I can't control my anger. And he says the first couple of counseling sessions with the can't person is, you got to change the can't to won't. I won't love my spouse. Uh, I, I won't stop overeating. I won't uh, stop being angry. Because it's not a matter of can't, it's a matter of won't. You have made the decision in your will that you don't want to do it, therefore you can't do it, which is incorrect. And this is, this is so borne out in just every part of life. Uh, we could have put a masterpiece of music here in front of Kevin this morning, and the masterpiece of music is dead until Kevin gives life to it by playing the synthesizer, the piano, or whatever this is. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be both. There needs to be the contribution of the composer and there needs to be the effort of the musician. Think about medical problems. You've got a medical problem. You go into the doctor. He gives you a diagnosis. He gives you a prescription. You go to the pharmacist. He gives you the prescription. And, of course, a pharmacy spent a lot of money developing that medication, whatever it is. Now, all those things are assets to you, the doctor's diagnosis the prescription, the pharmacist, the manufacturer. Those are all assets to you, but unless you follow the doctor's directions on the prescription, not going to do you much good. It's both God's power and our responsibility that's at stake here. Reminds me of the pastor who visited this fabulous farm, and the pastor says to the farmer, this is a great farm that you and God have. And the farmer says, you should have seen it before God had it all by himself. Now, that might sound a little sarcastic or cynical, but you know what? No disrespect. God works and we work. God always keeps his responsibility. Do you and I keep our responsibility? Our responsibility to what? Our responsibility to be connected to the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the John 15 power. Christ says, I abide in you, you abide in me, ask what you will, and it shall be done. The Philippians 4, 13 power, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Galatians 2, 20 power. It's not I, for I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's the Ephesians 5, 18 power. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and these uh, co endeavors. God the Father is the one who is working out in your life his will and his good pleasure and your willingness to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in those endeavors is what the will and to do is all about. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 where Paul says, I labored more than them all. Wait, not I, but the grace of God that was within me. And so, you know, <laughs> you know I, if I go home today and I say to Gwen, hey, I preached a great sermon today. Wait a minute, not I, but the spirit within me. You see, it's not I for the Christian loan, if it's going to count. You see, there, there are really two different sermons being lived today right before you. There's the sermon that is in the will of God, and there is the sermon that is out of the will of God. And it's really word by word and moment by moment. Because a man, moment by moment, is either trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit and trusting in the power of the Word of God when he's preaching, or he's not. 
And that can be a moment-by-moment -moment undertaking. Two distinct perspectives. God considers both the external motivation, excuse me, the external behavior and the internal motivation. And, and that which is done internally is so important because uh, although our sins may not be obvious now, and people have at times asked me, who do you think will be the most rewarded person in the church? And the, and the uh, tendency of Americans is the guy that's most visible will be the most rewarded. But that is not the biblical orientation. The biblical orientation is the person who is most faithful, uh, which could be a senior citizen who gives themselves to prayer several hours a day. They, indeed, may be the most rewarded person in that congregation, and nobody may see their secret prayers. This is why the, Luke, Christ said in Luke chapter 2, no, 12, verse 3, those things done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. That's both positive and negative. What you're doing now may not be seen in the cause of Christ. Uh, for example, uh, giving at Laurel Wood is confidential. I don't know who gives what. That's a secret. But someday, your stewardship will be an embarrassment shouted from the rooftops. What were you doing spending all that money on yourself? Or it'll be shouted from the rooftops that you were a faithful steward of what God gave you. And this has to do with a principle found in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 23, which says, your sins will find you out. We need to recognize that we are yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit moment by moment, or we're not. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is interesting because of the way the word fear is very often used in the Bible. Did you know that in the Bible, 365 times it says, fear not? Well, if the Bible says 365 times, fear not, what's the Bible doing here telling us to fear with uh, trembling? Well, it has to do with uh, the different kinds of fear. The fear of people will cause you to do unholy things, and these unholy things may not be unholy from the outside. For example, a person marries a person they shouldn't marry because they fear living a life being alone or fear never having the opportunity to get married. And they marry someone out of fear rather than out of confidence. This is the God, that, the person that God would have them to marry. That would be the fear of man. Uh, some people don't tithe because they fear that God will not provide for their needs. And so they have a financial fear that is not appropriate. So we can have fear for the wrong reasons. But can we have fear for the right reasons? Yes, we can. Listen to Proverbs 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord adds length to life. Well, that's a good fear. If fear of the Lord adds length to life, I want to add fear. Proverbs 15, 33, or 3, 15, 33. The fear of the Lord teach a, teaches a man wisdom. The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom. Do you want to be wise? Then you should fear the Lord. Isaiah 33, verse 6. God will be the sure foundation for wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. So fearing the Lord in the right sense, God tells us not to fear 365 times, but fearing the Lord in this sense produces obedience. And fear of the Lord in this sense prolongs life, instills wisdom, and opens up the treasure of the gods. Uh, God, Lord, help me fear. Lord, help me fear. Because this is a healthy fear that we all need. Now, since this is true, and many of you know most of what I said is true this morning, if not almost all of it, how is it 
that we don't obey the Lord with fear and trembling. Two considerations. One I'm going to call the inoculation problem. We have heard these truths so many times that when we hear them again or read them in Scripture again, we sort of say, oh, uh, that's not going to infect me again. So you sort of click off and you don't benefit from what the sermon is saying or you don't benefit from what the Word of God is saying because you, you've been inoculated against it. And that's sad. But the second one is even sadder. And I illustrate this by a little Bron, 11 years old, little, not so little, going to church for the very first time. And his uh, aunt takes Bron to church. And he really has had no Christian background. His uh, home is non-Christian, and it's not that they're anti-Christian. It's just that it never comes up. Well, Bron sits there, and the pastor's sermon does not give the historical context or the chronology of the sermon. And he begins to talk about how Christ, a righteous man, was unjustly persecuted, unjustly killed, and uh, how that it, was, that it was our sins that put him on the cross. And it's obvious to the ant that little Bron is becoming upset. And as the preacher goes on to describe crucifixion, little Bron even becomes more and more upset. And he begins to cry. And then as they leave the auditorium, he's crying, and his aunt looks at him and says, Bron, don't take it to heart. People will think you are strange. What a sad indictment. If we take the Word of God to heart, we will seem strange. But I think a lot of us, we obey the parts of God's Word that don't make us look strange, and yet we ignore the parts of God's Word that might make us look strange to family, friends, or relatives. This most often comes out in the area of evangelism. And sometimes, of course, it's our tactless approach to evangelism. But even if you are the smoothest, softest evangelist imaginable, the moment that person you're talking to understands that you're saying Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him, and that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are no others, and that all these attributes of Christ, 308 attributes of Christ, are true of this man who walked the earth some 2,000 years ago, they may think you're strange. Little Bron is an example for us. That morning, he took the sermon to heart. He thought for sure that people would go out and, and try to right this injustice that had been done to Jesus, or at least tell others who had the power to do something about it, that he would tell them little Bron wanted something to happen because of this good man who died a cruel death. You take the full counsel of the Word of God to heart, some of the people will think you're strange part of the time. But the question is not, what do people think? The question is, what does God think? Because it is God that we're to fear with trembling. Follow me is the most common command of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The way we follow Christ is... We honor his name above every name. The way we honor Christ is that we bow the knee both literally and figuratively at the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we live, we, we are subjects of the king. Are we going to display the manners of his court? Somebody has summarized it this way. It's not faith without works. It's not faith and works, but it's faith that works 
Work out your salvation with fear and trembling to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.